The Illustrated Principles of Advertising by Richard Murnack. What's the purpose of advertising? Advertising enables free trade to exist. It is the grease that makes trading a smooth process. It is a sign of a free economy. Advertising lets sellers display their product or service to potential buyers, and it lets those buyers be aware of choices to compare different products and prices. It is also a way to introduce a new product or idea into the market. From the advertiser's point of view, he's paying good money to have his product or service exposed to as many people as possible in a position to use the product. Is it important? Ask yourself when you want to sell something. Let's say a used car. You could put a sign on the car, park it along a well-traveled road, and reach only the people who go that way. Or, if you want to expand your potential market, you could start putting notices on supermarket billboards or calling your friends and neighbors to alert them to your sale. You'd reach only a few people. The next step would probably be to place an ad in a local newspaper, a larger market. But what if the car is a valuable collectible? Everyone seeing your ad may not want your car or be able to buy it, especially at your asking price. What then? Maybe an ad in a car collector's magazine or a local interest site. You're not going to question the value of advertising if you make a sale that way. It will be important to you. It's the same with anyone wanting to sell anything. And if you were looking to buy that kind of car, you'd be glad you saw the ad. What are the skills needed to create advertising? Three simple words. Analyze, create, persuade. Your ad, as with an ad for a General Motors car, has to employ these same skills. First, let's take analyze. What are we to analyze? The answer, the market we wish to sell in. It doesn't matter if it's your souped-up Chevy or a new Lincoln Town car. You have to know there's a potential customer out there. Like the old saying goes, you can't sell refrigerators to Eskimos. It still applies. You also have to know if you have competition for your product. Not just for your exact product, but anything that can be used to accomplish the same thing. Take snack foods, for example. If you're selling pretzels, you not only have to compete with other pretzel products, but like any other thing that could be considered a snack food, like candy, popcorn, chips of all varieties, even fruit. Once you understand what you're up against and have determined that there are potential customers for your car or product or service, you now have to determine how much they would be willing to pay for it and how much you would accept for it. These factors determine how you will price the item. You don't want to attract buyers who will then be turned off by your price or attract buyers who want to offer way less than what you would sell it for. This is what is called positioning by professional ad people. Getting the right positioning puts you on the right competitive track. It should be the result of careful analysis. Why are these skills valuable in real life? The same concepts that are necessary to creating effective advertising also apply to your everyday life. Every situation you are involved in can be benefited by careful analysis to find the basis of the problem or challenge, considering possible answers to it, and choosing the one that appears to be the best. If it also involves others, it will be easier if you can persuade them of the importance of their participation. You want their enthusiasm. And remember again, truth is very powerful as a persuader. When it comes to advertising aimed at you, be aware if the ads are persuading you or just making claims hoping you'll buy. That analysis will keep you from falling for appeals that are barely walking the lines of deceit or telling you something worthwhile. This applies whether you are buying, selling, or asking for a date. Everyone is always considering truthfulness. It is the great convincer. A tip. When you want to test or analyze an idea or concept, put it into your personal terms. It becomes easier to understand. Is advertising an art or a science? This question is constantly debated in the advertising world. There are people who believe if you could take enough surveys of customers once, it could be handled like a science. But the argument for advertising being an art uses the concept of persuasion. They point to the difference between what a science is and how it operates. 
The definition that makes something a science is that it can be predictable and repeatable. A scientist or engineer using the same procedure as another scientist across the world will get the same result. That works in science, but formulas and repeatability doesn't work to foster creativity or interest in advertising. The human mind isn't intrigued by the familiar. It hungers for something new, novel, and excitingly different. Something to fascinate the imagination and interest. Once you see a movie with a surprise ending or hear a punchline of a joke, you don't find the repeating of them that interesting. That's what makes persuasion so challenging in advertising. There are no formulas to follow, no safe way to be creative. That's why advertising is an art. Basic advertising questions. What exactly does sex sell? Another question being debated constantly is the question of using sex to sell a product. There are people that consider that a meaningless question because they've decided that sex does sell. My question to them has always been, yes, but what exactly does it sell? My view is that sex certainly doesn't sell any product that happens to appear next to what is happening that's sexy. Evolution has hardwired us to respond to sexual attraction for the survival of the species. Sexuality is its own payoff for attention. It attracts attention to itself, and it's hard to ignore. What does get ignored is any product that tries to take advantage of being in the vicinity of the sexual content. The only approach where sexuality does apply is when the product being sold has something to do with it. The success of Victoria's Secret clothing takes full advantage of this. Other products, like ED products, are very reluctant to speak directly to the problem, and use scenes of happily married couples in semi-romantic situations. They're selling a solution to a problem, but skirt around stating it directly. The one example where Honest Talk speaks directly to the problem is delivered by a very attractive woman who seems to understand the problem and speaks directly to it. Sex here isn't used as an attention getter. It is a topic of legitimate discussion. Tip. Don't throw your money after a cliché. Try a persuasive idea instead. What is borrowed interest? Whenever you are drawn into an ad by a device that isn't really organic or connected to the product being sold, you have been tricked by borrowed interest. When an advertiser doesn't think his message is interesting enough to attract your attention, they will use this device. It is a bad choice for them because the device they use to get your attention is by definition more interesting than their message, which defeats their purpose. You are attracted, but only to the device. Celebrities, sex, pets, shocking words or situations. And how many of you think the celebrity hawking a product isn't being paid to repeat the words they are saying and is only doing it for the exposure or money. The message of an ad should be to persuade you to investigate a product or service. That can be difficult in a competitive environment. And because it is, very many ads take what they think is the easy way to remember the product by, quote, entertainment, music, dancing, or pretty people. These things can be entertaining. But what about the message of the ad which becomes buried in all that? Who even notices it, let alone remembers it? I can remember the pretty girls, but don't have a clue what they were standing in front of or dancing around. Tip. Try to become aware of being tricked by different borrowed interests. Ask yourself if you were persuaded to try the products by them. A persuasive ad is very rich. It will have you thinking about the product if you are a potential customer. Whenever you see a persuasive ad, even if it isn't aimed at you as a customer, make a note of it. You've experienced a rarity. What is a weasel and ways to avoid being taken in by them? A weasel is a word or a term that modifies a claim or statement. It is a favorite tool of lawyers. It makes you think that you are hearing what you really aren't. Can they be accused of false advertising? No. They, quote, weaseled out of the claim. Weasels appear abundantly in advertising spiels with words like should, could, may, will, can, most times, mostly, usually, in the majority of cases, helps, 
the appearance of as much as reduces the lead to up to as soon as supports weasels make you think you're being promised something you aren't don't ever try to sue in court over this claim because any lawyer will point out that what you think they promised isn't so they only said helps minimize the appearance of scars not heals or gets rid of them catch the two weasels that's why legal departments of ad agencies love them they can make legitimate sounding claims without risk weasels here are some hidden weasels they aren't as obvious as the others in fact they are designed to bypass your awareness that they are weasels like this one no other brand gives you more or nothing is better nothing is worse either are they better than the others? No. It means they are the same as everyone else. Or this. Four times as much cranberry juice as theirs. A hundred percent juice. Does that mean a hundred percent cranberry juice? No. It's mostly apple juice. Or this. You could save as much as... There's a double weasel. It could be a lot less. Or this beauty. No excess gas. No gas? No. No excess gas. No. How much is that? Or this very subtle one to make any deal sound better. Available. Which really means you pay extra for this. It's not part of the deal. Recently I saw another weasel. Fights wrinkles. Make a list of all weasel words you see in ads. Arm yourself against weasels. Does guarantee really guarantee when you hear or see a claim in an ad that quote guarantees the claim it really doesn't if the rest of the sentence says or your money back this tactic is a favorite of mail order advertising because they know one simple truth about human nature if you order something especially something that can be consumed or used up and the product doesn't perform as advertised you will probably just throw away the rest the last thing most people would do is save the rest, wrap it up, and pay postage to send it back for a refund. Sometimes also having to fill out a form explaining your reasons for doing so. They know that. Statistics prove it to them. They don't expect reorders from you. These people deal in thousands, if not millions. And if someone actually does send it back, they will gladly refund their money. What a perfect demonstration against lawsuits. They get away with this because laws were lobbied to enable them to. If a consumer organization ever decided to be on the consumer side, they would lobby to have the law changed to have, quote, guarantee mean exactly what it says. The guarantee isn't that you'll get a refund if the product doesn't work but guarantees the claim they make is valid or be guilty of false advertising. Class action suits would then quickly change these legally fraudulent ads. Tip. Don't be fooled by the word guaranteed. The claim they are making is not guaranteed by it. You don't want the hassle of sending it back just to get your money back. They can make any claim for any product using guaranteed this way. Medical advertising versus side effects. TV ads for self-medication are becoming ludicrous and potentially life-threatening. Yes, they all say talk to your doctor, but how many will? Doctors don't have the time or inclination to discuss everything sold on TV. In fact, some of them push medications that have been given to them by the manufacturers because there is sometimes money in it for them. Most people, in the absence of doctor's advice, will self-medicate because of the claims they see on the commercials. If you are tempted to, just listen carefully to the possible side effects. Some range from the problem you are trying to cure to death. The death part is usually spoken quickly and at the end of the long list. The warnings on medical advertising are now so severe, including risk of death, paralysis, or many severe complications that it has become worse than the problem it is supposed to be treating. And usually they are only treating symptoms, not the root problem. What it comes down to is this. 
You take a pill to get rid of a pimple and your ass falls off. Tip. Self-medicating by TV commercial can be very dangerous. Sometimes looking up your ailment on a medical advice site will make you feel like you have every disease they talk about. You assume because it's on TV that it's safe to take. Why do you think these commercials have very lengthy cautions? They do it to protect themselves against lawsuits. Spokespeople. Whenever you see one of your favorite actors or sports person selling you something on TV, consider why are they there? Is it for the money? Or is it for exposure? Whatever it is, it's probably not for your benefit. They get the benefits. Sometimes the person is so wrong for the product they are selling, it is laughable. It's rare to see a commercial by a celebrity or athlete that doesn't look like someone reading a script. Growing up a Steelers fan, I saw Terry Bradshaw take a lot of physical punishment, including being dropped on his head. He understands pain. When he talks of shingles, I for one am surprised to know he has it, which makes his point about how most people who've had chicken pox have the virus in them. He isn't doing this for money, I assume, or for celebrity, since he's known for his sense of humor. If he compares the pain to more than what he experienced in football, I believe him, especially since the spot isn't to sell a particular product, but to talk to a doctor or pharmacist about what you can do if you have the problem. Tip. It's easy to be drawn into a commercial by someone you admire and would usually trust in real life but you must be extra vigilant against falling for the spokesperson and then falling for the spiel. Political advertising versus product advertising. When a claim is made for a product in advertising, it will eventually come down to the product to prove out the claim. If it doesn't, it will be found out and disappear from the market. That's the value of a free market system. When a politician uses advertising to make claims about he or she will do if elected, it's a ploy to get votes. If they are elected, they can't be forced to follow through. A product's function can be demonstrated. Try to get a politician to answer why they didn't do something they promised. They can use many excuses. The end result is that you, as a consumer, have been duped by false advertising. Here's a tip. Especially during election periods, the airwaves are deluged by political ads. Some are informative, but a lot of them are nasty, putting down their competitor. Be smart enough to spot the promises that are there merely to get your vote. Most of them will never be acted upon. Cause advertising. Most people who are interested in the goals of a cause aren't usually fanatical. Fanaticism is pushed by, quote, ideologues. These people believe the cause is more important than the means. Therefore, any means is acceptable whether it is shocking or even destructive. The operative words are raising awareness. That justifies everything. There is a commercial showing very young girls with adult words in their mouths, commenting on women's issues. I hate putting adult words in children's mouths to sell a product. These words are adult in the worst meaning of it. These young girls might not even know the meaning of the words. But is this ad effective in making people aware of pay inequality for women? The only thing people are aware of because of this commercial is that some ideologues don't care that coming into your home showing these young girls swearing is telling your kids this language is okay. Sure, they sometimes hear the F-bomb from adult mouths, but not from kids' mouths. The sad part is this ad wasn't about women causes. It was done by a website to sell t-shirts. Tip. Be very wary of cause advertising. It is not backed by anything that can be used as proof of what they are saying. It is a pure form of propaganda designed to get your approval or action, as propaganda does not give you both sides of the issue. It wants you to take what they are saying on faith, not proof. How does legitimate advertising differ from propaganda? Legitimate advertising has one thing that propaganda doesn't have, and that is something to check truth against. That something is a product or service that can be compared to all the claims being made to see whether they hold up against the real thing. Propaganda, because it isn't based on a real object or service, 
is based on the principle that one must accept what is being claimed on faith. Faith is called that precisely because it has no substantial proof to base it on. If it did, it would be called fact. There's no way to test it. Therefore, you are left with the only thing to do but, quote, trust me. Historically, propaganda has been used to influence people to accept ideas that would be rejected if the truth were known. Dictators and leaders of men and nations have resorted to tried and true methods, especially if they had control of information flow to the public. The person who perfected these techniques was Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany under Hitler. As propaganda minister, he had complete control over all available media of its time, radio, print media, and movies. He could tailor any message he wanted to mold opinions without the danger of being contradicted. Another example who also pioneered these techniques was the Red Chinese, who experimented with the idea of, quote, brainwashing to accomplish the same goals. One of the techniques was the, quote, half-truth. This method is to tell a truth that is generally accepted and marry it to a propaganda lie as a package deal. The truthful part is accepted, and it is hoped the lie is accepted as well. People hearing this will remember the truth part and not question the lie part. The other technique is called the big lie. Here, a lie is told over and over again so often that it starts to become accepted as real, since people have heard it so much from so many different sources. Both of these techniques are still alive and well in our modern world, mostly in the realm of politics. Whenever a candidate wants to smear his or her rival, telling a half lie is usually picked up by the media if it is juicy enough and repeated robot-like from network to network. In today's instant news flashes, it can travel fast and do its damage before the victim can have a chance to rebut it. The same with the big lie. Once it is launched, no one knows who started it, but it keeps getting repeated. A tip. Today's media frenzy atmosphere requires the ability to listen and then analyze all the claims and statements to be able to differentiate between the ones meant to control your thinking and behavior and factually based statements. The appeals are becoming more sophisticated and therefore more difficult to discern, but it is to your advantage to train yourself to be aware of the differences. Conceptual advertising and how it differs from entertaining advertising. Organic conceptual advertising does not use borrowed interest. It isn't, quote, lifestyle advertising. Its purpose isn't to, quote, get attention or to, quote, entertain, or to create a situation hoping the feelings will rub off on the product. Now that you know what it isn't, let me tell you what it is. Its purpose is to sell the product creatively and effectively, using the nature of the real problem to find a real solution. In a few words, truthful persuasion. When an advertiser asks for help in selling his product and is willing to spend good money to do it, he doesn't want to subsidize someone's career as an entertainer or filmmaker. He is looking at the situation as a hard-nosed businessman. In order to earn that money, any ad agency must figure out what problem he's been having making a breakthrough in the marketplace with his product. That's where the organic comes in. You can't solve a problem until you know what it is. That requires a thorough analysis of all the factors in the chain, from the product itself, to the distribution, to the sales message. Only when you find the weak links can you attempt to rectify them. When you do, you will see a remarkable change in his sales picture. That's why he's asking you for help. If he could do it himself, he would. Solving the problems you found is where conceptual comes in. Your solution must be rooted in the nature of the problem. If it is, you have a chance to make a difference. If not, you could just be wasting his money. That's where all the other approaches fail. Just getting attention isn't enough. Some creative people stop there, thinking, well, just breaking through the clutter of the media is enough. It isn't. You can get attention by shocking the audience, offending them, or just insulting them, or by using borrowed interest, which uses something much more interesting than the client's product 
to lure the audience in. The inevitable result is disappointment at being tricked. No one likes to be tricked, do you? Another misconception is the use of sex to lure viewers or readers. That doesn't work for the client either. Everyone is hardwired to react to sexual situations by Mother Nature. That doesn't mean they will ever notice what is being nudged into their view around the sexual activity. I never noticed, although I looked at all the sexy stuff. That's just another foolish waste of the client's money. Any ad agency using these pseudo-strategies will soon be looking for another client. A businessman concerned with his bottom line will see the waste sooner or later and be gone. A tip. Being aware of techniques that are designed to control your perception and direct you to products that don't really show you the benefits of their use can prevent you from wasting your own money chasing an illusion or image. Just remember, it's the product itself that is going to benefit you or not. Using advertising concepts in life. Advertising requires three skills. Analysis, creativity, and presentation. These coincidentally are the same skills you will need in your quest for success in real life. We have spoken somewhat about analysis and creativity. So now I'd like to focus on presentation. It is one of the secret skills that enable a person to take his or her very creative solution to the next level. The reason is that a new, really new idea has not been seen before and will require persuasion in order to get the people who will make it happen on board. That means supervisors, boss, or client. Sometimes just a meeting of your local board or committee, or maybe family members. It is a skill that keeps on giving. When you have a new or novel idea that requires persuading, who better than the person whose idea it is to present it? It is this skill that is sometimes the difference between success of the idea or failure. Voice. A key feature of the ability to present an idea is your voice. A strong and confident voice goes a long way to convince a listener of your confidence in the idea. That's crucial since a hesitant, stuttering voice projects the opposite to the listener. He is listening to you trying to determine if he has trust in what you are saying. And as you know, trust is a key factor in persuasion. When I first got my creative director's job and I realized I'd have to make presentations to a group of people and that everyone had to hear, even in the back of the room, I realized my voice wasn't up to that. I had grown up on a farm and rarely needed to speak except to call the cows home. My voice was intimate, but not strong in a sense of projecting. To change that, I took acting lessons and voice lessons to perfect the projection. One of the exercises was to actually sing along with records to keep up the range of the singer. It worked. I knew the ideas I was presenting scared a lot of careful clients who needed to be convinced even if to go back to their company and tell them to their people, for you, if that has to be worked on, do it. It's worth it. In one of my advertising classes, a very shy girl usually had very smart answers. But when it was time to tell them to the class, could hardly get a sound out of her mouth. No one paid enough attention at her to even hear the sometimes brilliant solutions. I had her stand on her desk and shout her ideas so the last person in the room could hear her. She got the point. It worked. Nervousness. Another key feature of presentation is confidence. I mean real confidence, since trying to fake it becomes obvious. One way to be confident is to be prepared. Then you know that whatever comes up, you can handle. A sign that you're not confident is outward nervousness. I'm not speaking about the excitement you feel in your belly before a big event. That's good. Any athlete will tell you they don't like going out onto the field unless they feel that excitement. Otherwise, they will probably give a flat performance. They even sometimes do things to raise their adrenaline level. Watch football players before a big game. Getting nervous has to be interpreted as excitement, which is very natural when you are about to go outside your comfort level. You just don't want to project nervousness. There is a little secret I learned in one of my acting classes 
That is valuable to know. I learned it because the instructor used a video camera to film all the exercises the students did. You would not see the tape until the next week in class. By then, you were sitting as an audience watching everyone's exercise as a third-party audience very remote from the emotions that occur right after doing the exercise. During my exercise, I was extremely nervous. I expected to be able to see that in the video, but to my complete surprise, I couldn't see it at all. I realized that if I didn't tell anyone I was nervous, no one would know. In my advertising classes, the first thing students would do when they came to the front of the room to present was to say how nervous they were. In the real world, that might get them some pity, but in the world of persuasion, it worked against them. I forbid my students from ever telling the class they were nervous. We all know you're nervous, but don't tell us or anyone else. It ruins your believability. Creating and presenting a new idea. If an idea is needed to solve a problem, the best thing to do is immerse yourself in the problem to be solved. The real problem. Because sometimes the problem that presents itself isn't always the actual real problem to be solved. First, get to that root cause. Then, after immersing yourself in it, make a list of possible solutions. The next step is to place each solution into the problem situation and imagine what would happen in that case. Some will seem like possible solutions, some won't. Throw those out. I got some very good advice from one of my professors, Professor Paul Kim, whose method, when you are up against the wall creatively, is to strip away every easy answer. He felt only then does real creativity begin. I also found that it's possible to tap the huge creative potential of your subconscious mind. After you have submersed, tried possible answers, and thrown out all the easy answers, take a break or go to sleep on it. Your mind starts working on the problem the moment you stop focusing on it. Give it a few days if possible. You could be surprised by having a creative solution pop into your consciousness at unexpected times. It happens. Try it. It happens quite a bit. Once you get used to using this untapped potential, you'll look at it as an ally in your creative process. The value of persuasion. I have stressed the value of persuasion because it is based on a fundamental element of human emotion, trust. Once trust is established, it is possible to bring people to your efforts willingly. They may be unsure of what you are suggesting, but in many cases, they will give you the benefit of the doubt. Once people rely on your judgment and it proves to be true, they are more willing in the future to go along with with new ideas if your judgment stands behind them. I had a situation when I was working as a creative freelancer when very few assignments were available and I was looking for an opportunity to get into a longer lasting situation. Most assignments when they came along only lasted a day or two. I was called into a small agency because the owner realized he didn't have the creative manpower to service a client coming in that next day. He wanted to impress this client with more people in the conference room. When I showed him my work, he asked me to come tomorrow. There was no time commitment. The next day I came in and was just in time for the client meeting. We all sat in the conference room and I was introduced as one of the staff. I hadn't seen the work they began presenting to him and when I saw what was being presented, I could see on the client's face that he wasn't satisfied but was reluctant to interrupt. After the presentation, the owner went around the table asking the others what they thought of the work. They all knew the owner liked it, so to a person they agreed it was good. He neglected to ask me. The client noticed. He asked, well, what about Richard? The owner had no idea what I would possibly say other than knowing I didn't want to mess up this work contact. As I usually do, I asked if the client really wanted to know what I thought. I asked that because I don't believe in not giving my best professional opinion when it comes to advertising. He said, yes, I do. By that time, I had analyzed the problem to be solved and figured out the right way to go. When the client said he wanted my opinion, I looked at the owner 
who was pale in the face. I knew it was possibly my last minute in his agency. I started by explaining my analysis of the problem and by showing the client why this other solution didn't work. I then told my solution to the problem. The client's face lit up. I had hit on exactly what he was feeling about the agency's work but couldn't express his objections clearly. As what happens in places like this, everyone seeing how pleased the client was, jumped on the bandwagon, even the owner. As we left the conference room, I was the last of the, quote, staff to leave. As I said goodbye to the client, he said, Richard, I'll see you again next week. Gaining the client's trust, plus some quick analyzing, made all the difference. I worked there for the next two to three months before I accepted a position as a creative director in another agency. Will understanding advertising make me a smarter consumer? The biggest fish in the pond got that way by being able to tell the difference between the real food and the food-looking lures in the water. That's what a smart consumer becomes, a big fish, a survivor of the war of the lures. Knowing what a weasel is and not being swayed by, quote, borrowed interest or, quote, guaranteed or spokespeople or even the lure of sex can make you that smart consumer. Being able to see behind the lures is a cultivated talent. Practice it. Add to your list of weasels. Make a note of persuasive ads and why they influenced you. The skills used in both creating and recognizing good and bad advertising concepts are equally applicable to your success in any industry and in your own life. Analysis is useful in any endeavor, whether it's sorting out a complicated argument or breaking down a process of being manipulated. It will set you apart when people want to find someone who can help them understand an issue, whether personal, business, or political. And the added bonus of being able to apply it to advertising will show itself in unexpected places. The skill is being able to distill an idea from a confusing situation. That helps everywhere. Creativity can be applied wherever a new and unexpected solution to a challenge is needed. Some people with creative attached to their title go around claiming that ground exclusively for themselves. As a creative director, I made it clear that a good idea can come from anyone at any time. My job as a creative director was to recognize it when it does. The skill involved is to be able to pick out the best one. That's where analysis helps. Presentation is where the idea has the opportunity to fly. It's where your skill of persuasion will be the most important. My goal in writing this and my advertising blog, theadmanspeak.blogspot.com, is to make my readers aware. I hope this book does it for you.